All right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings, and you know, we actually uh, we actually talked about this story, just we alluded to it in a, in a message just recently, and uh, but we're going to look at it tonight. 2 Kings 6, verse 8. 2 Kings 6, verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of. In other words, the king of Israel thought, is this really true? So he sent somebody to check it out. And sure enough, verse 10, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He said, okay, who's, who's the leak here? Who's telling our battle plans? Verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray, with blindness. So what's happened is, you know, um, the servant goes out early in the morning, and um, from where Elisha's house was positioned, he could see the city was surrounded by the enemy army. And he goes back into uh, his master, Elisha, and says, Elisha, he says, we're done he said, what in the world are we going to do now? And Elisha says, he says, no, it's not what, it's not, it's really not what it appears to be. He said, the people that are with us are more than they that be with them. And he's talking about the spiritual end of that. And he prays and he says, Lord, open my servant's eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened his eyes and then he saw the horses and chariots of fire. You know where horses and chariots of fire had just, just occurred not long before? And that was when Elijah went up to heaven by a whirlwind. And Elisha is walking with Elijah. And uh, Elijah says, you know, what, what would you like to ask for before I go? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, man, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me when I'm taken up, then God will grant your desire. So they walk and they talk, and suddenly uh, the heavens open, and horses and chariots of fire come down and scoop up Elijah, and Elisha looks up and says, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He says, I can see it. And as Elijah goes up, his mantle falls. And Elisha picks up that mantle, and he goes to the Jordan River and he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he smites the, the, the river Jordan and the river parts. And that was the beginning of Elisha's ministry. And uh, they figure, as you count the, the miracles that Elisha did, he literally did double the miracles that Elijah did. He asked for a double portion and God gave it to him. So in this story, though, um, he says, Lord, open his eyes and 
and so that he may see. Well, suddenly in comes the Syrian army into town and they come to his door. And Elisha, can you picture it? Just cool as a cucumber. I mean, he's not the least bit worried. And he says, he prays again. He's just said, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And now he says, Lord, smite these guys with blindness. And all of a sudden, that whole army, they can't see a stinking thing. And so you know what they're doing? Now they're going to hold hands. A bunch of grown men having to be led, holding hands. I'm sure that felt really manly. And they're, they're all, all these big bruisers with their swords and their armor. And, and so let's read on. Verse 19, and Elijah said unto them, this is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me. They really didn't have much choice. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, now watch, here it is again. Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. That's not where they intended to be. They are now surrounded by their enemies. Verse 21, And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hadst taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Lord, please help us as we look at this, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, to me, the, the, the verse I want to look at tonight is verse 17. And it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, speaking of his servant, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You know, um, in, in that moment, that young man experienced something that he would never forget as long as he lived. And um, there's just, uh, it, it's unbelievable what he experienced there. He saw what was invisible. Those horses and chariots of fire and, and angelic beings that were there, uh, they had been there all along, but suddenly he saw them. He saw what was invisible. It says, Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Um, you know, in the Bible, and of course, we've actually looked at a few of these in, in recent days, and so we're not going to go back over it. But we talked about angels here a couple of Sunday nights ago, and um, uh, Paul said, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby... Some have entertained angels unawares. Um, you know, often in the Bible, the Lord let somebody see what was invisible. The Bible is actually full of that. And I don't mean they saw a truth. I mean they saw something that normally is invisible, but suddenly they saw it. Um, man, you've got Dan Daniel. He interacts with Gabriel. You've got the shepherds at the birth of Christ. Um, you've got Moses at the burning bush and, um, you know, there's just, there's just all sorts. You got Paul, you know, and, and, uh, that night, uh, before he steps out of the, of his cabin there on that ship when it's in the storm and boy, there's just, it just happens over and over and over. But this young man saw what was invisible. I know you do, but do you believe that there are many invisible things going on around you at any given moment. Um, in this room, they're here. They're here. You don't see them. 
You don't hear them, but they're here. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. They're here. Uh, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of He's here somewhere. And I, I, I have to confess, most of the time I, I really, I'm not thinking about that when I'm, when I'm here. But every once in a while I think about it. I thought, wonder, I wonder where he's at. I wonder, wonder where he's sitting. You know, you're going to go home and, and those angels, they, they follow you home. They're with you. He shall give his angels charge over thee concerning thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And of course, you know, there's the, there's the, 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 the dark side. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, you know, that, that invisible side is there. But he saw it. This young man, he literally saw it. What he saw was real. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't something he imagined. It wasn't virtual reality. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a construction of Hollywood. It wasn't a hologram. Um, what he saw was real. What he saw was far more powerful than the visible. He saw, first he saw the visible. He saw the armies of the Syrians. And that, that was powerful. They're, they were powerful. But then he saw the angelic beings and, uh, you know, one angel could destroy 185,000 Assyrians in one night. That's just one angel. They're far more powerful. What he saw relieved his fear, and instantly the emotional tension changed. When he looked out there and he saw the Syrians surrounding the city, you know, they didn't do that. They didn't do that to drill. This was not an exercise. They didn't do that. For them to suddenly be surrounding that city meant, uh, okay, well, at, at, at the best case scenario, we're all going into captivity, but that's normally not the way it worked. They would come in and they would kill all the strong first to make sure there would be no resistance. And then the rest were, so he's looking at this. You know, he's not going, I wonder what they're up to. No, 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 no. Everybody knew what this meant. But when he saw what Elisha prayed, he said, Lord, open his eyes. And suddenly he saw all around him. It relieved his fear. It's interesting in the Bible that, that when God did this, God only revealed the heavenly world. He never revealed the demonic world. Never. It's interesting. What he saw put him in awe. What he saw gave him thrilling anticipation because he knew, okay, I don't know what's going to happen here, but something's going to happen. What he saw gave him an edge over everybody else. Can you imagine that morning? As, uh, as you know, everybody else starts coming out of their house too. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there were ladies crying and ladies going back in their house and, 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 and you know, hugging their kids and, you know, but, but he's, st he's standing, he's smiling. He knows this isn't going to turn out bad. What he saw, only a very few would ever see. What he saw... He saw because somebody prayed. What he saw gave him an awareness of another world. You think he'd ever forget that? What he saw would help him through some of the most dangerous years of his life. This guy was a young man. So let, let's say he was 14 or 15. He was big enough to, to do the work that Elisha needed done. You know, in youth, choices are made and viewpoints are formed. But he had seen something. Something. 
as we, all of us, as we get significantly down the road of life, usually we see more. Generally, this is true. I know some people become later in life spiritually blind, and uh, you know some people that this isn't true of. But but usually, as you begin to go down the road of life, and and you get a little further down the road, you are forced to acknowledge that there are indeed laws that govern life. I mean, there's physical laws, there's mental laws, there's domestic laws, there's laws of habit. There, you know, you get, you know, when you're 18, 19, 20, you've had a he- real heavy duty diet of uh, a Hollywood and the internet. You know, you 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 don't recognize all that, but um, you get a little further down the road. You know, in youth. A lot of people, a lot of young people live and they're encouraged to live as if the dark side of these laws will somehow never affect them. But you know, they hit about 35 or 40 and the illusion starts to disappear. By the time youth is passed, and you know, youth is that time of great opportunity and great energy. By the time youth is passed, And I hope this isn't true for any of our young people, okay? But you guys understand. By the time youth has passed, many damaging experiences have occurred. And most of the youth in our world will have been stung and scarred, and they will carry thinking that clouds their judgment. And they will learn some terrible things by experience that they could have avoided if somebody had instructed them and if they'd had a heart to receive it. But this man, this young man's eyes are opened. And they are opened by prayer and they are opened by God, not by pain and regret and sadness. How many people's eyes are opened because of pain and regret? But this young man's eyes were open without that. You know, youth is usually a time of blindness and short-sightedness. But his eyes are opened as a young man. Again, I say, would you ever forget this experience? Would you ever forget this? He was not told about this. He saw it. You know, it's one thing, you know, we tell stories, you know, and even the night we talked about, you know, how angels sometimes make their appearance even in our world. And, you know, we talked about some people that really think that uh, perhaps uh, an angel came across their path and they're not totally sure, but they think because of the way it all played out. Um, And, you know, we love those stories. Um, I I was talking to a lady in uh, Montreal and, um, um, you know, one of those stories had been told at the meeting. And, um, and she said, she said, and couldn't we all, she said, I could listen to those stories all day long. And we could. But you know, the, the thing about the story is we, we, we don't see it. We're just told it. And it's thrilling just to even hear about it. But this guy didn't hear about it. He saw it. And it was, it was what he saw wasn't, I wonder if those were angels. No, there was no wondering to it. He had seen it. He saw eternal realities in in this, this hour of his life. He saw that there was indeed a man of God. He saw that. You know, we got some Christians in our world that they've come to this conclusion that they've just, they've just sort of, you know, given up on a lot of things and, and they've just come to this conclusion that men of God are a thing of the past. But this guy... He would never doubt there was a man of God. Look at verse 6. Now, verse 6 takes place before our story. An axe head falls in the water and the sons of the prophets. And the, and the one guy says, I, Master, I borrowed it. Verse 6. And the, the Holy Ghost says, and the man of God. He didn't say Elisha. He said, and the man of God said, where fell it? Look at verse 9. The king of Syria comes, verse 9. And the Holy Ghost doesn't say Elisha. The Holy Ghost says, and the man of God sent. Look at verse 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God 
told him. Look at verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God, you know, one of the things this, this young man saw, I don't know what he thought about Elisha before this point. I'm sure he had some great, you know, obviously he felt very privileged, you know, it was a real honor to work for Elisha. But you know what he realized in, in that hour, you know, this guy, he's living with Elisha. Okay. He is his servant. He's getting up in the morning. He's, he's getting his firewood. He's making his breakfast. He's drawing his water. That's what they did. And they're doing all this stuff. And by the way, that's what Elisha had done for Elijah. And now he's doing it. I'm sure that he saw if, if there was imperfection and we know there was, you know, there's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Elisha, you know, there was probably a few moments that the servant saw where he just went, oh boy, he's not, he's not, he's not having a good day today or whatever. But you know what, you know what he saw in that hour? Elisha bows, bows his head and says, Lord, we'll call him, we'll call him Homer. Lord, Homer's nervous, God. He, he can't see what I can see. Lord, would you just, would you just give him a little, little glimpse of what's going on here? One line. You say, oh, I believe that. And that was, that was Second Kings. That was a long time ago. Did you know there's still men of God? Carl Lackey, he's with the Lord now, but Carl Lackey lived up until, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. Carl Lackey was a, a mountain preacher in, uh, in uh, West Virginia, somewhere in the mountains of West Virginia. In his lifetime, he did some really unusual things. And uh, there's actually many guys that this story could be told about. Um, but he was very unusual. And out in, in the middle of a rural area, in his lifetime, he built a church of over a thousand people. But Carl Lackey was wild and crazy. And uh, he was kind of guy, he, he made a lot of people really uncomfortable. And when he get up in the pulpit, he's one of those guys, you just never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. And it wasn't always kosher. Sometimes it was really crude. And, um, but, but, um, and some of y'all have a problem with that, but let me just say this. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I think a preacher ought to be careful what he says. I'm just making a statement. Can we go back to the Bible for a minute? Elijah, Elijah and Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves and wailing. And, and is Elijah over here going, oh God, help these dudes. They don't know what they're, that's not what he's doing. He's going, cry a little louder. Maybe he's asleep. <laughs> You're an idiot. That's, you say, some of you, if a preacher to you say, well, he shouldn't do that. You need to read your Bible. Boy, if there was ever a man of God, it was Elijah. And you say, well, I bet God would have. No, God was very happy because God felt the same way. And that's why 35 verses later, fire falls from heaven. Okay? You got to start measuring stuff by the Bible and not by you. We get in trouble with that. Carl Lackey, he was a nut. He really was. And um, he preached one night. He got up, big meeting, and he preached on some things I'd preach on if I just had time. And he, he, he went from subject to subject to subject, and he came, he came out behind the pulpit, and he had a skirt on. And he started preaching on women wearing men's clothing and men wearing women's clothing and all that stuff, you know. And, and, then, and then, then the next thing, you know, he comes around and he's got like a fake cigarette and he's talking about cigarette smoking deacons. And he said, I'd really preach on that if I had a little time, but I don't have time. And, and he, just, he just went on and on and on. That was Carl Lackey. You say, what's so man of God about that? You know, some of these guys, you know, I think that where really some of this deal shows up about whether a man of God is, when they bow their head and pray. One line, Lord, open his eyes. Um, I know this story because a friend of mine was there. He said, uh, we, were, we were there, and we were going to have a revival meeting, and he said, all of a sudden, he said, there was, there was a few of us in the room, and he said, all of a sudden, Brother Lackey got a phone call. And um, it was from one of his men and he said, my wife just left me. 
He said, she left me. He said, it's been about 12 hours ago. And he had waited to call Brother Lackey. He said, Brother Lackey, he said, we don't know where she is. And he said, it's not good. And uh, he said, I just, I just, um, he said, would you please pray? And Brother Lackey said, I sure will. And he hung up the phone. I don't know what these preachers have been talking about, but the preacher that told me the story said, and Brother Lackey suddenly got on his knees. And he said, now, Lord, you know where she is. Lord, this is all wrong. She's out of her mind. She shouldn't have done this. But Lord, you know where she is. Lord, if you'll have her call me right now, I'll encourage her to come home. He said it wasn't 30 seconds. The phone rang. It was her. And he said, sweetheart, you know you've made a big mistake. <laughs> and she agreed. And he said, listen, sweetheart, your husband loves you. I love you. Why don't you just come home? 30 seconds. I could tell you more of those kind of stories. They're still men of God. This young man would never, ever forget. I, I bet this young man would hear somebody make an ignorant remark about Elisha. And maybe he wouldn't even rebuke him, but he'd just walk away saying, I know something about him you don't know. That man's got a connection. He saw that there was a man of God. He saw that prayer was real. He saw that God did rule in the affairs of men. This young man saw that God would step into this world to help one man that loved him. You know what this was all about? This was all about Elisha. Look at verse 17. Now watch the wording. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. I love these words. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. Now watch. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about, not about the city, about Elisha. He saw that heaven gathered round one man that loved him. And he saw that the gracious God of eternity would share the sight with him. And I don't think he ever doubted after that, even though it hadn't been written yet, if God be for us, who can be against us? So I want to encourage you tonight with three thoughts and we're done. First of all, the Bible says, now all these things were written for our admonition. It says the things that happened to them beforehand were for us. So you got somebody you're praying for? I know you do. That's why we're here tonight. I know you do. But I want to encourage you. Could, would you. Would you pray this first of all for the youth that you see that you know can't see. You can see it. You have tasted it. You know it's real. You know what God's done in your heart and life. And you know, uh, uh, you, you know it's real, but you know what? You, you've, you've got somebody and you, you know, they've heard it all and they've, and you know, they're, they're just, they're just, you know, whether they got their fingers in their ears or whatever it is, and you know, they can't see it. You know, you can see it as plain as day, but they can't see it. You know what? God says, why don't you pray this? Lord, open his eyes that he may see. You know, some people's problem is they just don't see it. They just don't see it. But boy, it sure would change a lot if they could see it. You know, for some of us, there was a day we couldn't see it either. But God opened our eyes. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. Pray it for the youth. Pray it for the youth. You got a young person you're praying for? 
I got a dear friend of mine. I love him. I got more than one of these, actually. But I got, I got a dear friend of mine. And he loves the Lord. But his son is an atheist. You say, what do you do? You pray. The tendency is that you will pray sometimes and you will pray and you'll pray for sometimes a long time. It just seems like nothing's going to happen. Um, there's a missionary that I, I don't know that he's still up in the Arctic. He, he was literally up just, just not far from the North Pole and um, from the Arctic, not far from the Arctic Circle. <laughs> And he was working in some of those isolated villages, and he was there for years and years and years. Can you imagine? Um, what you don't think about those kind of places is the winter time. You're a missionary there. All that darkness, and you know that's legit. And and the the the, the drunkenness and the the substance abuse and the depression, all that stuff. You know, it's a very it's a real big problem over there, and um, in in those places, and. Um, this this missionary they had they had a bunch of kids, and um, and one of their kids for whatever the reason, it really affected them. And uh, one day, horror of horrors, he got a hold of a, a shotgun, and um, he tried to commit suicide. And by the mercy of God, he survived. He was never the same after that as far as he couldn't hardly, one side of his body was affected. He could walk, but, you know, he, he was all messed up from that day on. And then he was bitter because he, didn't, he wasn't able to finish the job. But, you know, in the background was his mom and dad. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. There's some things I just pray and I say, oh, Lord God. Lord, I don't want to go anywhere near any of that. But, boy, it happens, it happens to some of God's good people. It really does. And they prayed and prayed. And, but you know what? He didn't get right with God, and he just went, he went further out into the far country, and he got away from home. And um, long story short, a bunch of time passed. But way back up in the Arctic, his mom and dad are still praying. And he, I don't know the whole story. I just know the part that I heard. One day he was, he was walking up the stairway to his apartment, you know, hobbling up the stairway to his apartment. And, um, and he said he, he, he got up there and, and, um, and he said he literally felt a hand on his shoulder and it pushed him to his knees. And he said, in that moment of time, he said, I realized that God was real and that I was wrong, terribly wrong. And he broke down. Again, he grew up in a missionary home. He'd heard it all a thousand times. And he said, I got on my knees and I wept my way back to God. He's on the mission field today over the sea with a wife and still hobbling around. You know what God did? God opened the eyes of a young man and he saw. And he saw. You know, God still does that. Look, 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. It'd be wonderful, though, <laughs> if you let God open your eyes before you were in that shape. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, you need to pray it for youth, and then you need to pray it for all men, all the people that you know that are lost and blind. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, notice it's a small g, that's Satan, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine into them. Boy, there's one thing the devil does not want. He does not want them to see. He doesn't want them to see the light. So it's a good prayer to pray for all men. 
You don't need to turn there. But in Psalm 119, and this is the last one, so you, you can pray this for you. You can pray this for, for all the lost that you know. And then you can pray it for yourself. Now, I know you're already saved tonight. I think just about everybody in here would, would say they're saved. Um, you know what David prayed in Psalm 119? He said, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. He said, Lord, I can see and I can read, but Lord, why don't you touch my eyes? Open thou mine eyes. I think it's an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture, and I often think about this when I'm praying. I, I often I hear that phrase in my head, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. So I just want to encourage you with that. The Lord still opening blind eyes. And in the passage, again, in the passage that we read, he does it three times. He opened some eyes then he blinds some eyes and he opens them again. And each time it was by prayer. And the lesson is prayer repeatedly accomplished this. Prayer repeatedly accomplished this. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Lord. There's some things, Lord, even, even in our midst, Lord, that you've, you've done in the last few weeks that are wonderful. And God, we're thrilled, and God, we're asking for more. And um, Lord, would you help us, God, that we would, again, with a new confidence in Thee, Lord, that we would come to You and ask You, Lord, that You might open the eyes of the people, Lord, that are so blind, be it by this world or their education or, you know, whatever, Lord, they're just so blind. But, Lord, we know that has never, ever been a problem with Thee. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that in these next, this next little while, this next short little while, God, let us in this church. Lord, there's a lot of names that just keep coming up in every, every prayer service, Lord. And, God, we're asking You. Lord, we know You could save them 10 years from now. But, Lord, we ask, please, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, would You hasten that? Lord, would You make no tarrying? Would you open their eyes that they might see? Lord, would you let us hear about it, Lord? And God, you would be glorified. Lord, it would be to your praise and your honor, Lord, because you're the one that's going to do it, Lord. All we can do is ask, but you're the one that can do the work. Lord, we ask, oh God, that you would do it. In Jesus' name we pray. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Lord, thank you for this wonderful story in your book. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that it gives to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.